Hello and happy Mother's Day. Mother's Day presents a challenge for pastors and preachers alike. It's an easy day, but a challenging day at the same time. Easy because it's not like we have to pick a topic. It's pretty much set in stone. You know what the message is going to be about. It's going to be about mothers or motherhood. But challenging because, at least for me, I have a desire to bring something new and fresh. Something that hasn't been said before. And there's been lots of Mother's Day messages. Now, of course, I could probably recycle a Mother's Day sermon that I did three years ago, and many of you wouldn't even know, but I would. But today, what I want to do is just highlight one verse, one passage of Scripture, one Scripture verse that talks about motherhood. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, which says this, the Apostle Paul writes, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. And as I talk about this verse, what I see here highlighted is the concept of motherhood and how it leaves a lasting legacy. Of course, another challenge in, one of the, in the Mother's Day sermon and the Mother's Day message is that though I want to talk to mothers and about mothers, there's a challenge to bring a message that is real and relevant and connecting with all of us. And I believe that God wants to say something from this scripture about what it means to leave a lasting legacy, which is what mothers do. Of course, the audience is diverse as we each experience Mother's Day in a different way. Even talking to mothers, there's so many different women in different areas and stages and experiences of life. Those who wish they were mothers. Those who are mourning as mothers. Those who may miss their mothers. There are stepmothers and adopted mothers and foster mothers. There's Single dads, grandmothers, aunts and uncles who are doing their best to be surrogate mothers. There's those out there who have been rejected, abused, neglected, or even abandoned by their mothers. And we all experience and celebrate this day in our own ways. But I believe there's something in the picture of motherhood that God desires to show us a secret He longs for us all to know. A secret about his desire and yearning for us all to leave a lasting legacy. Now as we begin to discuss this, I want to introduce to you Timothy. This verse is in an epistle, a letter to Timothy from Paul. And who is Timothy? Timothy is the first second generation Christian leader mentioned in the New Testament. That could be a, a little tongue twister there for you. So I just want to say that again as we think about what that means. He's the first of the second generation of Christian leadership in the New Testament. Paul writes about him and describes him in 1 Timothy 1-2. He says, to Timothy, my true son in the faith. He calls, Paul calls him my true son in the faith. And we see here, Timothy is an epitome of Christian success. He's a defining person of Christian success. In our base scripture, it says, the sincere faith that you have. That's what a definition of Christian success is. It's a sincere and genuine faith. So as we together today unpack biblical wisdom for life, let's look together on what God desires us to know about leaving a lasting legacy, His heart's desire for all of us. And throughout the scriptures, Paul writes in 1 and 2 Timothy to his son in the faith about this legacy. He teaches us that we can leave a lasting legacy through the power of prayer, through the teaching of the truth, through the test of a testimony, and through the aim of amore. Of course, every time you say that Italian word amore, you have to use your best, most pathetic Italian accent. 
the aim of amore, the aim of love. So let's start off with the power of prayer. And if you're following along in your own Bible, you could probably mark between 1st and 2nd Timothy, as most of the scriptures I reference will be from that area. In 1 Timothy 1.18, it says this. Paul writes, Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. I like how he highlights that. Timothy, to fight well in the Lord's battles. Timothy, like all of us, faced and experienced challenges. And he had to fight those battles. So often, we can be tempted as we look at social media to look at other people's lives and think that everybody else's life is just one long vacation. But everybody has their own battles. And sometimes it's those who smile the, the brightest who have just become most proficient in hiding their pain. But we all have battles and battles to fight. And Paul says, I'm going to write you these words, these instructions that you might fight and win the, in the Lord's battles. James 5.16 says... The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And in 1 Corinthians 10.4, it talks about the weapons that we have to fight the Lord's battles. And it says the weapons we have are not of this world. Rather, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. One of my favorite worship songs has the phrase in it, the lyrics, Every prayer is a powerful weapon and strongholds come tumbling down. But I believe the, the power of prayer is a double-edged sword in the battles of life that we all face. In life battles, the weapon of prayer is that double-edged sword because it has two powers at work. It's the power of secret prayer and the power of proclaiming prayer. In Matthew 6:6, 6, 6, Jesus said, when you pray, go into your room Shut the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Pray to a God that you can't see. And then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly. Pray those private prayers to God. And there's a power in those, in praying those prayers. As mothers pray who, for children that they have not yet conceived as they pray for the child in their womb, as they pray over their infants, praying the prayers that no one but God hears, there's a power in that. I remember praying for my sons, even in the hospital, right after they were born. I loved it when Nathaniel, my second son, was brought into the nursery and his cart was right next to a Hispanic child who was Jesus. So I can say, my son Nate, was right there in the nursery with Jesus. It's been a privilege for me to pray for my sons, to pray for their careers, to pray for their salvation, that they would come to know Jesus in their life, to pray for their future wives and the parents of their future wives, that they would train these young women up to be good godly wives, to pray that my sons would grow to be the men that deserved such wonderful wives. I prayed for my wife and I to have the wisdom to teach and to train our sons to grow up. And I continue to pray, believing in the power of prayer. I have a good friend, Carol, who will testify to the power of prayer, even to the prodigal son, to the one child who has gone far away from home and may even be far away from the Lord to return. Because these prayers, even these private prayers, when no one hears but God, are rewarded and they are powerful and effective. If you want to leave a lasting legacy, pray for your children. Mothers who pray for their children leave that lasting legacy. But there is also the power of proclaiming prayer, which I believe is illustrated here in this verse, 118 of 1 Timothy. He says, here are my instructions to you based on the prophetic word spoken about you earlier. He seemed to know that Timothy was aware of the prophetic word that were spoke, words that were spoken about him. Timothy heard the men who had prophesied over him and proclaimed God's will for his life. And, God, and Paul was saying, I'm giving you instructions in accordance with those prophesied words, in, cord, in accordance 
because of those promises that you have. I believe also as Timothy was growing up, as we see this godly legacy from the women in his life, that he knew and heard the prayers that his grandmother and his mother prayed over him. He knew their heart's desire for him in the spirit as they prayed for him at a young age. And as we are called to live, lead, leave a lasting legacy, we're called not only to pray for our children in private, but to pray over them. Let them hear the words that we proclaim. Let them hear the promises that we are calling out over them. To pray over them so that they might hear what we pray and know that prayer about them and for them and with them is a natural and continual occurrence. It's amazing if you've ever had kids, you know that when you speak directly to them, they can't seem to hear or understand what you're saying. But you, if you talk about them, even from across the house, they will hear you. So we are called to use that to our advantage. Use that to your advantage, mothers, and pray over your children that they might hear and experience this. But also, as you pray over them, you are teaching them to pray. In fact, it's in Luke 11, 1 through 4, it says of Jesus and his disciples, when Jesus, one day he was praying, when he was finished, his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray the way, in the same way that John taught his disciples to pray. And Jesus said these words. He said, when you pray, this is how you should pray. Pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We even say ourselves that a Picture is worth a thousand words. And when Jesus was asked to teach his disciples how to pray, he didn't write a book on prayer. He didn't start off with an object lesson. No, he started off and said, this is how you should pray. And he showed them how to do it. He prayed with them and for them and prayed over them. In the same way, mothers leave a lasting legacy through the power of prayer by teaching their children how to pray, by praying and proclaiming God's word over them, praying for their children to, to hear them so their children would know how to pray. And so to leave a lasting legacy, we teach our children to pray. And when you teach your children to pray, teach them to pray according to the word of God according to the will of God. God will not grant any request in prayer and not answer any prayer that goes against his will and against his character as revealed in his word. So as we incorporate prayer into leaving a lasting legacy, we are reminded also to incorporate teaching the truth and teaching the truth of God's word. Timothy's mother and grandmother did this for him. As it says in 2 Timothy 3.15, You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you wisdom to receive salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, God says, These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. We are to teach our children the truth, the truth of God's Word. And teach it diligently and continually. If you want to leave a lasting legacy, don't leave this up to the school system, even if your kids go to a private or Christian school. This is a command from God to teach your children diligently and continually in each and every day and every area of life. Make it a part of everyday conversation. The school system is to teach our children the three R's, to teach them history and science and math but it's the responsibility of a parent who wants to leave a lasting legacy to teach the children, their children, the truth. And don't leave it up to the church. 
because this book can't be fully and adequately explained in a 30-minute Sunday school lesson once a week. That's about enough to teach our children that it was Noah, not Moses, who built the ark. And it was Jonah, not Joseph, who got swallowed by a whale. I'm not discounting the importance of Christian education and of learning in Sunday school, but it, the Word of God is to, be, is to be on our hearts continually. In fact, if all you get, the only instruction you get in the Word of God is a 40-minute sermon once a week, you need more. We need to be diligent in teaching our children and in learning and having God's Word on our heart on a daily basis so that it can penetrate into our souls and become part of how we live. Of course, even as we study and teach the Word of God, I'm reminded of the old movie, A Few Good Men with Tom Cruise. In one part of it, Cruise, who is a lawyer, is trying to illustrate that the, manu the training manual doesn't have all the answers. He asked the one soldier, he said, where in this book does it tell you where the mess hall is? And the soldier says, it's not in there. And he says, well, what, don't you eat? And he says, of course. I just knew where to go because I followed everyone else at lunchtime. Understand that gives us an idea that even praying for your children while is good and teaching them instruction is important, but we need to take it to the next step if we really want to leave a lasting legacy and give a testimony to teach our children by the test of a testimony. Elsewhere in our scripture, it says this in 1 Timothy 4.16 Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Anyone who's been around kids knows it's pointless to say, do as I say, not as I do because kids will just automatically follow in our footsteps. I'm reminded of the Rod, Rodney Atkins song, Watching You, about a, a man whose four-year-old son learns how to cuss from his father, but also learns how to pray from his father. There's that testimony. And mothers know that training a child up, as the Bible tells us to do, is more than just instruction. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train your child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. But training is more than just instructing. In fact, the test of a testimony is not so much what you instruct, but what you teach. And we teach through our actions and the way we live. 1 Timothy 4, 16 says, Be careful how you live, how you act it out, and your doctrine, because it's the way you live and how you live out your faith that will per preserve you and those who listen to you. Children want to see us living out what we say we believe. You can pray and you can teach, but we also have to show. To leave a lasting legacy, we have to show others what it's like and what it means to live it out. Now remember, Christian Christian success is a sincere and true faith. That's what Paul talked about. He says, that sincere and true faith that you have. That was Timothy's lasting legacy. And so while we train up our children to be polite and to say please and thank you, even more important to leave a lasting legacy is to show them what a life of faith is like so that when we pray and we ask for God's provision and we talk about His protection and we talk, teach what the Bible says about how God provides for us, we can also live it out, live out that trust and faith in our daily lives. What good does it do to say, yes, God provides everything and then live like it's all dependent upon us? Children look and want to see genuine and sincere faith. And to train our children, we need to let them see us face life's problems, not to hide them from everything, not to protect them from seeing that the world has difficulties, but let them see us face life's problems and how we face it. And when we make mistakes, which we all do, to ask forgiveness, to acknowledge, hey, I was wrong. I could have handled that better. 
Children don't expect perfection, but they long to see sincerity. And so we leave a lasting legacy through our prayers, through teaching the truth, and through the test of a testimony, through living out our faith. But we also need to remember the aim of amore. In 3 John 1, 4 says this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Motherhood is difficult. It is challenging, but it is also rewarding. And every mother will tell you, every godly mother will tell you that they agree with this verse. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So what is the aim of Amore? What is the aim of love? 1 Timothy 1.5 says, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. The aim of love is the aim of our charge is love. The aim of leaving a lasting legacy is love. The reward for a mother isn't really the crayon colored page or the burnt toast she receives on Mother's Day. It's knowing that her child is walking in the truth. And the purpose of motherhood in this life isn't to have the perfectly manicured child shoved in a trophy case that never gets dirty but to be able to release that child out into the world, to be successful, to be happy, and to experience all that God has for them. Psalm 127 verse 4 says, Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are our sons born in one's youth. And I love that picture that the Bible gives us. Realizing that the aim of Amore isn't to hold on, but that a child is like an arrow in the hands of a warrior. And arrows are meant to be placed in the bow like a weapon and then released into the world, into a target. Children are not to be held on to, but to be trained up and then released into the world to make an impact in the world around us. And that is the aim of love. I remember when I was 19, my mother, who loves children, was down at the road taking pictures of all my brothers and sisters, getting on the bus for their first day of school. And then she came up to the barn with her outdated Polaroid camera and took a picture of me in my flannel with a big old pinch of dip in my mouth on my first day of no school. I could see in her eyes the smile and the sorrow of pride and joy and sadness as she was watching her son growing up. And that is the, the beauty and the bittersweet reward for the mother who leaves a lasting legacy and is willing to release her children into the world. As we looked at this, we see in the picture and scripture that God gives us of motherhood, a practical application on how we are to leave a lasting legacy. Through the power of prayer, the teaching of the truth. Through the test of a testimony and through the aim of amore. But if you remember how I began Starting off saying that God longs for us to see something greater, a secret that He longs for us to know in the picture He gives us of motherhood. That as, even as we apply this, there's a deeper longing of God's heart that He wants us to see and be inspired by in the picture of motherhood in which He gives us. In 1 Timothy 2.15, it says this, But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. This verse has two points. And before I get into the main point, I just want to highlight the second. The continuing in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Like a mother's love, the love of God is permanent and never-ending. And yet throughout the scripture, there is a command for those who receive it to continue in it. In Matthew 24, 13, Jesus said, He that endures to the end will be saved. There is a call to continue in it. 
Now this call to continue is not because of God's weakness to hold on to us, but rather of His meekness, not to force us into a relationship with Him. In John 10, 38, Jesus said, I give you eternal life and no one can snatch you out of my hands. But also in John 8, 36, it says, Jesus says this, Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You are free to remain in His love, but free to walk away. So both Jesus and I encourage you, hold fast, hold tight to continue in the faith and continue in this relationship with God. But also, there's a deeper meaning here in 2 Timothy 1.5. Sorry. In 1 Timothy 2.15, that women will be saved through childbearing. Now, to explain it, first I got to start out with saying the obvious of what this verse doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that the only way women can get saved is through having babies. And if you believe that, we'll have a conversation later, though I won't look forward to that conversation. Because if we really believe that, then we believe that there's no men in heaven. Men can't get to heaven. Children can't get to heaven. That the woman who's barren is cursed to live in an eternity in hell, and we don't believe that. We also know that the Bible tells us that our salvation is through faith through God's grace and faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, It is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We understand that salvation comes through faith. But what God is saying here is, I believe the picture He wants us to see in motherhood is that as mothers leave a lasting legacy, this is something we are all called to leave, that we are saved through the multiplying of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know that even as we celebrate Mother's Day, that a mother is not just someone who is biologically a parent, that it's not just the one who has gone through labor, but also the one who has stepped up and entered into that relationship of raising a child. A mother is someone who's given birth and or someone who has also taken the responsibility of raising and rearing children. We know that just in the same way that a Christian is not just a nice or good person, any more than a mother is just a nice or a good woman, but someone who has raised children, who has given birth and raised children. In the same way, a Christian is someone who has experienced the love of Christ and then walks it out by sharing it. In 1 John, it says this. In four, ver, chapter 4, verse 17, this is how love is made complete, how our true identity is expressed among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. As He is, so are we in this world. In Matthew 7, 20, Jesus said, you will know a tree by its fruit. And that fruitfulness is sharing and reproducing that life. So a Christian is someone who shares and reproduces that life, that life in us. We are all called to enter into the Great Commission. If you've received the love of Jesus Christ, you experience it and engage in it by sharing it with others. We are saved through childbearing through the multiplying of the gospel, and we experience the salvation of God in that. I hope that you understand that the meaning of motherhood is that legacy we're all called to leave, a spiritual legacy to those around us. But even more, as we celebrate Mother's Day, we celebrate this gift of motherhood, we also celebrate the opportunity we have to be born again, to be born from above. In John 3.3, 3, Jesus said, Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And it's a privilege that we have to be born of the Spirit, to be born of God, to allow the Holy Spirit to be our eternal mother, even as God the Father is our eternal Father. I encourage you today, if you don't yet know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I know that you have 
come to give me eternal life. I confess my sins to you and ask that you come into my heart. I want to be part of your family and live with you forever. I believe that you died on the cross for me, that you rose again on the third day. I receive your grace and forgiveness even now. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today from your heart, you have been adopted into the family of God. I encourage you, let someone know that we can celebrate along with you. Just text SAVED, S-A-V-E-D, to 973-755-1637. As for all of us, we thank you for joining with us today. I hope that you are inspired, encouraged, and challenged to leave a lasting legacy for yourself. As always, it's your prayerful support and financial donations that allow us to get these messages to you and out to the world. Until next time, remember, Jesus loves you, and so do I.